your nation, your province, your Southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News Weekend Edition. Hello, I'm Naveen Day. Thanks for joining us for our Week in Review. The Alberta government passed its first bill since the election. Bill 1, the Alberta Taxpayer Protection Amendment Act, prohibits the government from increasing personal or corporate income taxes without Albertans' approval through a referendum. One commentator said Alberta Premier Daniel Smith is figurative, figuratively slapping the handcuffs on herself, making it nearly impossible for her government to raise taxes. The bill passed its third reading, 47 to 35. The province also announced some changes to Alberta's health care system. It includes transitioning Alberta Health Services into an organization which focuses more on hospital care, urgent care, cancer care, surgeries and emergency medical services. It will also answer to a seven-member board. Alberta NDP leader Rachel Notley says the changes will open the door to privatization, but Premier Daniel Smith says, quote, there is absolutely no plan to privatize health care. At a news conference during last weekend's AGM in Calgary, she corrected a journalist by saying she's not looking to dismantle AHS, but rather disaggregate it. The way I think about it is Alberta Hospital Services. They should be providing the very best acute care in our 106 or so acute care facilities that we have across the country or across the province. Um, and so some of the things that you've already seen, you'll see a little bit more of. For instance, we already began the process of disaggregating mental health and addiction. It's a separate ministry that has, uh, it's, it's a separate authority and more of those resources are going to fall under mental health and addiction. You saw a couple of weeks ago, primary health care. That is now also a separate pillar. Smith is promising that frontline jobs will be protected, but says there will be a, quote, process of streamli streamlining in the management layers. The transformation is expected to take up to two years. Our legislative reporter and the Alberta correspondent for the National Post, Tyler Dawson, says talk of the proposed changes actually came out in a leaked document earlier this week. It's a big overhaul, and I think, you know, at this point, people are still sort of trying to uh, digest it and figure out what it means. But but the Coles Notes version of it is that you're going to have four sort of separate agencies running healthcare in the province. You're going to have AHS is going to be responsible for ho hospitals and acute care. You're going to have a separate board for addictions and mental health, a separate board for continuing care, and a se separate board for primary care. And there was record-breaking attendance at the BMO Centre last weekend as more than 3,700 delegates attended the United Conservative Party's annual general, general meeting. BCN was there and reports that almost all resolutions passed. One person is taking credit for why this year's numbers are so high. Executive Director of Take Back Alberta, David Parker, says he rallied thousands of people to the AGM to support democracy. Uh, I think there's over 2,400 people from Take Back Alberta here. And, uh, and they're all very engaged. Every annual general meeting of the United Conservative Party, and it's different for every party how they do this, but they elect half of the board every year that governs that party. This board picks the rules of the game. And while Parker's supporters hold numerous seats on the UCP board, Alberta Premier Daniel Smith says she's not concerned that more than half the board members are from TBA. If anything, I would say the, the, uh, what I hear mostly from people who want to seek a position on the board is they want to make sure that we have fair, open nominations, that we allow for um, a proper vetting procedure in advance of somebody being told uh, of, of a race being open so that people are told whether or not they're going to be allowed to run in advance. Those are the reasons why people go on a board. And during her keynote address, Smith took time to fire shots at federal leaders. Even despite losing on Bill C-69, that legislation was struck down by the Supreme Court. They are still hell-bent on imposing those destructive leftist policies on the people of Alberta. You know what I say to them? Not a chance. Not as long as I'm Premier. Two major issues in which Smith received the most applause were the government's plan for disaggregation of Alberta health services and parental rights. I want every parent listening today to hear me loud and clear. Parents are the primary caregivers and educators of their children. Attendees also approved 29 of the 30 policy resolutions. These include banning the use of electronic voting machines and provincial funding to supervise consumption sites and to refuse transgender women to be housed among biological female inmates in correctional facilities. 
A motion to implement a school voucher system was defeated. Policy resolutions are brought forward by party members and are non-binding, but they do provide grassroots direction on what it thinks the government's policies should be. Still to come, many Albertans are saying, hands off our CPP. Plus, we honour the veterans on this Remembrance Day. It appears that many seniors are quite concerned about Alberta potentially pulling out of the Canada Pension Plan. It was a hot-button topic that was not brought up during Pre Premier Smith's address at the UCP's annual gen general meeting or during the throne speech. But it doesn't take away from the fact that it's on the minds of many Albertans, including our seniors. Jeanette Rocher reports. At first it was like panic because you never know what the heck's going on with your livelihood as we get older. You know, it's a little bit scary. Scary, not just for herself, she says. De Jager is worried for her kids who still have a few working years ahead of them. A little bit leery for the younger generation, let's put it that way. On the flip side, the provincial government says the people of Alberta pay too much into CPP compared to the benefits they receive, and that an Alberta pension plan would fix all of that. But for now, De Jager says she's not buying Premier Daniel Smith's promise that seniors and working Albertans could actually see more money in their pockets if Alberta pulls out of the federal plan for its own provincial one. I think that is just kind of a, kind of enticing to make, make it sound like they're benefiting, but we don't know that yet. So that's still to be found out. Also to be found out is the actual amount Alberta would be entitled to. Uh, we're not getting consistent information from different sources about what we're entitled to. Bradley the Fortune is the executive director of Public Interest Alberta. He's been doing talks around the province about some of the concerns they're seeing with the province's proposal. Number one, it's not a priority for most of the Albertans that we're talking to. People in Alberta are concerned about the economy, affordability, access to things like health care. Number two, within the details of the proposed plan, it's very clear that nobody except for the UCP government thinks that Alberta is entitled to 53% of the asset pool, which is $334 billion. Federal Finance Minister Christia Freeland recently said she would ask the chief actuary to provide an estimate of the asset transfer. But Alberta's choice about the CPP also implicates every single Canadian. And although Premier Smith did not address the issue during the UCP annual general meeting over the weekend, she did respond to questions about it at a media scrum. If there was any movement on that, it would be put to a referendum. All the assets would be put towards the fund as well that you'd either have to see an equal or better benefits or equal or lower premium. I was pleased to see that Christian Freeland committed. And once we have that number, we'll have a better idea of whether or not Albertans want to go to a referendum. CPP has been with us since 66. It's been good for 60 years. Why, why fool around with it? Let's put it that way. For Bridge City News, I'm Jeanette Roche. This week, we observed not just Remembrance Day, but also National Indigenous Veterans Day. Many Canadians are not aware of the many sacrifices Indigenous people made in fighting for our freedoms and helping form the Canada we have today. Charles Crowchief is the son of an Indigenous First World War veteran who fought at Vimy Ridge. I had the opportunity to sit down with Crow Chief to hear some of the stories his father passed down to him. You may recognize this mountain as Vimy Peak in Waterton. However, to the Blackfoot people, it is Maestoy Nanastico, which translates to Crow Chief Mountain, named after Joe Crow Chief. Crow Chief fought in the First World War, particularly in the Battle of Vimy Ridge. The mountain was later unofficially named after him for his deeds on the battlefield. His son Charles was in Lethbridge to share some stories. Shortly after leaving his residential school, Crow Chief enlisted in the Canadian military. He says he regretted going to war. This war doesn't belong to us native guys. We have nothing to do with it. But we go over there, I found that out. What am I doing here? Shooting other people. They didn't do anything to me. Charles also shared a story of how his father saved a wounded soldier's life at risk of being shot by Canadian soldiers. When he got there, the, the leaders, 
I will shoot you, both of you, right now. You know, we can't doctor him. He says, I didn't care. I saved him from that place. And years later in Edmonton, Joe Crow Chief met that soldier's son. They were in the bar. The guy gave it to him. This is all well. My dad was safe by this native. My dad's safe. The guy just jumped at him. So you're the guy. The assault on Vimy Ridge began at 5.30 a.m. on Easter Monday, April 9th, 1917. For Bridge City News, I'm Naveen Day. Up next, a retired Canadian Forces colonel weighs in on the war in Gaza and Ukraine. But first, a short break. You know, some of the most terrifying moments in our history have been in the midst of conflict. Many historians agree that as we observe Remembrance Day, it is more important than ever to talk about war and history. Wayne King is a retired Canadian Forces Colonel, and he gives BCN's Hal Roberts his thoughts on the wars in Gaza and Ukraine. Wayne, war is never pleasant, but many people believe that it's often necessary to really fight for our freedoms. What are your thoughts right now on the ongoing war in Ukraine? And how about the war between Israel and Hamas right now in Gaza? Those two situations, although uh, separate, uh, separate locations in the uh, structure, both in the Middle East, but they are linked in many subtle ways. Uh, the Ukrainian war is one which I certainly hope is resolved uh, successfully in terms of expelling Russia from Ukraine and allowing Ukraine to resume its status as an independent, free, and democratic nation within the, the world structure. Uh, there is no reason, in my, in my view, why uh, Russia decided to uh, invade and take over a good portion of the Ukraine territory. Uh, they may have had some squabbles, but that doesn't mean that uh, they they have the liberty and the right to assume ownership and and uh, sovereigns over what is an independent nation. My difficulty with the uh, Russian invasion is that unless it is uh, stopped in a very decisive and internationally supported manner, any uh, political uh, temporary halt to the uh, the war will only represent a short-term pause, allowing the Russian uh, military and nation to rearm, restructure, reorganize, and come again whenever they feel strong enough to do it. As far as the Hamas versus Israeli situation, this whole thing has uh, been a, uh, a proxy war from other Middle Eastern nations. And uh, certainly when uh, Israel is attacked by, uh, in an unknown manner, uh, unforecast, unwar uh, uh, unwarranted manner, uh, they have every right to defend themselves. And there, there is, uh, I think, the onus on the uh, international community, whether through the UN or other uh, national organizations, to seek a uh, permanent, long-lasting solution. Israel deserves uh, to uh, be a sovereign, independent nation. The uh, uh, average citizen within the uh, Gaza Strip and so on are not, in my knowledge and experience, uh, a warlike group. Uh, they are hostage to the situation, and I certainly feel that uh, they're they're being punished for the sins of other nations, and it's uh, something that uh, only through uh, decisive international uh, action it can be resolved in a in a good manner. So, Wayne, what was your reaction like? I want to circle back to Ukraine for just a moment here, when that um, former Ukrainian 
officer who fought for the Nazis in the Second World War, I believe his name was Yaroslav Hanka, was honored in the House of Commons. Everybody stood up, gave him a standing ovation that many people didn't even realize he was a former Nazi. What was your reaction like when you found out that our Canadian politicians were doing that? Well, my reaction, like many, many Canadians, was that it represented a very uh, dark blot on our uh, international image uh, to recognize and celebrate uh, an individual in our, uh, in our parliament who had that kind of a background, that kind of a linkage with the, the group that uh, we fought a World War II over is one which uh, gave me uh, a great deal of concern. And, uh, and I think a majority of Canadians uh, felt uh, that it was something that never should have happened. Why this situation was not properly vetted in the first case, I don't know. I'm not a politician. I don't know how the, the ins and outs, the day-to-day -day, uh, activities occur. But clearly, the ball was dropped and very, very badly dropped. Up next, the Trudeau Liberals' popularity seems to be tanking across the country, according to polls. Political analyst Brian Lilly weighs in after the break. Welcome back. The United Conservative Annual General Meeting in Calgary was well attended by the party's delegates, but also by the media. According to political reporter and Toronto Sun columnist Brian Lilly, one media outlet, the CBC, fired shots at the UCP for promoting parental rights. He tells BCN's Hal Roberts that the national broadcaster either has an agenda to push or is tone deaf. Take a look. Brian, you've been a longtime critic of our public broadcaster, the CBC. Now, this time your criticism has something to do with their coverage of the UCP's most recent annual general meeting, the AGM, which took place in Calgary. I mean, Bridge City News was there. We were there at Snappy Park covering all the many resolutions that passed. As for CBC's coverage, what really caught your attention? There's this great big headline, and then it was repeated on all their political chat shows, um, controversial motion about parental rights. And I thought, can these guys not read polling? Do, have they not seen it? Or, or, or do they have an agenda? And my view is they have an agenda. On parental rights, which they just keep dismissing as illegitimate, ill-informed, bunch of hicks. Um, you know, the, the idea that this is controversial, of course, it comes back to the uh, SOGI, the gender pronouns, all of those issues. And the, the most definitive polling we have on this is from a few months ago from the Angus Reid Institute. And they looked at it and said, should mom and dad be informed? Now, there was a split on whether mom and dad should be informed and give consent or just be informed before schools can make changes to names, gender, or pronouns. But 78% said mom and dad have to be informed. That's the primary basis of why CBC says it's controversial. Only 14% in that poll said, oh, no, mom and dad should never be informed. That's the side CBC's on. So they view a policy that 78% of Canadians say yes to, that 82% of Canadian households with children under 18 present say yes to, and they say that's controversial, but the 14%, the side that they are always defending, well, I mean, that's normal, that, that, that's mainstream, 14%. I mean, it's absolute, absolutely ridiculous. You wonder why CBC can't say that Hamas is a terrorist organization? They can't read a poll properly. They don't want, know what's controversial and what's mainstream. you got to learn how to read the room. Brian, something Alberta Premier Daniel Smith has been talking a lot about recently is the potential of an Alberta pension plan. Now, this has also caught the attention of Federal Finance Minister Christian Freeland and our provincial counterparts who met recently to talk about it. How feasible is this, Alberta pulling out of the Canada pension plan? Uh, it's feasible. It won't be easy. Um, obviously, as we discussed last week, you know, Ontario's finance minister, Peter Bethlen Falvey, a very conservative guy, very level headed guy. He has concerns, especially when Daniel Smith says we want more than half the money. That's going to make him sit up and say, well, wait a minute, we've got 40 percent of the population. How do you get more than half the money? So, you know, there's going to be back and forth like this. But the, the Trudeau liberals are really trying to campaign hard on this. 
as, as the poly of conservatives were asking about the carbon tax pause this week and asking, you know, will you extend it to the rest of the country? The liberals would stand up and say, you can't even stand up for pensions. Why are you talking? Like they are making this into an issue like you wouldn't believe how they're trying to drill it down. Uh, you know, I go back to the firewall letter, which is what, more than 20 years ago from Stephen Harper, where Stephen Harper said, we need a firewall in Alberta. And that includes an Alberta pension plan. Uh, I believe there was a call for a, a an Alberta provincial police force. And people still in central Canada look at these ideas and say, well, how on earth can you do that? Well, Quebec has an Alberta, uh, Quebec pension plan. Quebec has a provincial police force. Ontario has a provincial police force. These sorts of things should not be controversial. It's how you go about doing it. Do you do it in a sensible manner? I'll give Premier uh, Smith credit for this. She seems to be trying to do it in a sensible manner and says she won't even hold a vote until she can give Albertans a clear number on what's there. Um, you know, it, maybe in the end, she only ends up with a better uh, uh, deal for Alberta, and that's probably a good thing for her voters. Maybe she ends up with an Alberta pension plan. If so, I hope it doesn't hurt the rest of the country. But that's the concern that, you know, you're going to hear from Peter, people like Peter Bethlen Falvey. In the meantime, you're going to see the Trudeau Liberals campaign against Alberta, as they do on everything else, to try and scare voters in the rest of the country to vote for them rather than the Conservatives. Want more from us? Head on over to our website, bridgecitynews.ca. The website's at the bottom of your screen. Or you can scan this QR code to get right to our homepage. Up next, toys and cash were a-flowing. At least 10 Southern Alberta charities receive an early Christmas gift. In the spring, we have our awareness motorcycle parade and, and teddy bear parade, which is combined into one event. And uh, so that event, we gather up teddy bears and funds. Welcome back. It's that time of year when we need to start thinking about Christmas giving. But it appears one organization is already ahead of the game. Instead of using Santa's sleigh to deliver toys, though, they've ridden motorcycles to collect them throughout the year. As Jeanette Roche reports, several Southern Alberta charities benefit, benefited from the generosity of the Southern Alberta bikers. A little bit of a donation. and oh, thank we'd you. Like Christmas came early for at least 10 local nonprofit charitable organizations this week. Bags and bags of toys were packed up, carried out, and delivered to children at YWCA's Harbor House, Lethbridge Family Services, Chinook Regional Hospital, as well as the Colehurst Legion. The toys are going to go to our kids' Christmas party, which is happening on December 10th for members, children um, ages 12 and under. The stuffies accompanied some giant checks, most for $500, but all of them totaling 10 grand. And they were handed off by the Southern Alberta Bikers Association. Dallas Hardy is their president. Um, our fundraising efforts have been just so successful. We're just gleaming with happiness. We actually sanctioned two major events throughout the year. Uh, in the spring, we have our awareness motorcycle parade and, and teddy bear parade, which is combined into one event. And uh, so that event, we gather up teddy bears and funds. Um, a lot of that goes to the Chinook Regional Hospital. And then in September of each year, we have our uh, Southern Alberta Toy Run. Again, uh, cash, teddy bears, toys, um, all donated. Um, stuff donated from the general public and the business community. Lethbridge Pregnancy Care Center received their donation while celebrating their 10-year anniversary. And in that time, we've had over 1,900 women come through our doors. So we're really thankful for that donation of $500. They'll go a long ways to help our clients. So not only do we offer that emotional and practical educational support, but also practical supports. And so that can look like things like diapers, formula. For a lot of women, um, a concern for them in parenting is the financial piece. Knowing that there's somewhere that they can get support with those things is a huge relief and can really lift the burden. Donations also went to Lethbridge and District Humane Society to help dogs like Tony here. Also receiving donations were Streets Alive Mission, Chinook Child and Youth Advocacy Center, Lakeview School, the Good Samaritan Society, and the Green and Yellow Group. Just a great day for us as a group to be able to go out and put some smiles on, on faces and, and see the fruits of all of our hard work through the, through the year. For Bridge City News, I'm Jeanette Roche. 
Teachers became students this past week. To help them prepare for their Remembrance Day lessons, a group of social studies and history teachers from various Southern Alberta school divisions were hosted by the Lethbridge Military Museum for an evening. The educators say the tour helped give them an under, a special understanding of Lethbridge's rule during war, war times, and it's a nugget of knowledge they can pass along in their classrooms. That's right, it's about bringing the history to life of Southern Alberta and being able to connect with the kids in their own classrooms here. I think that was the whole reason behind organizing tonight is so, so a lot of our younger teachers who haven't had a chance to come to the museum would get a chance to come and, and see, yeah, the amazing array of artifacts that we have. I think a lot of people maybe don't appreciate the rich military history that Lethbridge has and this museum is a, is a great place to start. I'd love to bring my students here, yeah, for sure. Um, and I think there's parts of this that we don't talk about. Right where we're standing right now, like even just the local history of the P prisoner of war camp that we had on the north side in Lethbridge, right? And for them to come and see that and, and see these models. Uh, the artifacts are awesome as well because they kind of, they tell the story, right? And so there's only so much you can do in a classroom. It brings it to life a little more. The Lethbridge Military Museum is open from 12 to 4 p.m. on Wednesdays, but special tours outside of those hours can be arranged by calling the museum. The City of Lethbridge will no longer be collecting yard waste in green bins every week beginning November 7th until the spring. James Nichols, Waste and Environment Collections Manager, highlights how the initiative will differ during the winter months and how locals can optimize the usage of their green bins. We are going to be moving to a bi-weekly schedule. So what that means is that half the people in the City of Lethbridge will receive their collection each week instead of everybody receiving weekly collection. Uh, and again, there are lots of items that are still going to be going into the green cart, and that's why we keep that bi-weekly schedule. I uh, really want to take an opportunity now just to emphasize the food waste portion, because we know there are lots of opportunities for people to be putting those food waste items into the green cart. And again, thinking a little outside of the box, so again, thinking of things like pizza boxes, uh, paper towels, those uh, soiled cardboards, uh, not just things like uh, you know, your eggshells and, and traditional food waste. Over the past six months, the city has seen more than 4,000 tons of materials being redirected from the landfill and into the green carts. That's certainly good to see. Coming up, we speak with an award-winning artist celebrated for her abstract expressionist sculpting. But first, a quick break. Stay with us.